join me now in our prayer preparation. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Today we continue our series on 24 hours that changed the world. We are focusing in on those last 24 hours before Jesus was crucified on the cross. We've talked about Jesus' last supper with his disciples and Jesus spending his last three hours praying to God in the garden. Now we look at his arrest and his trial by the religious leaders. When Jesus was first arrested, he was taken to Caiaphas, the chief priest's home. Today we might think of him as similar to the Pope. He's in charge, he's the boss, everyone listens to him as the religious authority for the Jews. So when Jesus is brought before him, it's a significant moment. They brought him into Caiaphas' home and likely lowered him into an old cistern. A cistern, if you don't know, is like a well in the ancient world, where a deep hole is dug and then lined with stone. Jerusalem had a soft layer of limestone just below the surface, and that made it especially easy to create these cisterns, so anyone of note would have one. The problem, though, is that these could easily crack and leak. So not only were they, there were a lot of cisterns in Jerusalem, there were also a lot of dry, cracked ones. When they couldn't hold water, they became great for holding prisoners. So imagine Jesus being held in this underground cell and the religious leaders up above him deciding to immediately put him on trial. This decision was totally out of the ordinary since Jesus was arrested in the middle of the night after a major holiday. If you were here a few weeks ago, I mentioned how the Passover meal was served at 7 p.m., included lots of food and wine and concluded at midnight. This would be like trying to wake up a judge for a trial at 3 a.m. on New Year's Day. Good luck with that. Yet the religious judges, called the Sanhedrin, were gathered to put Jesus on trial. That says something about how urgently they wanted to deal with Jesus. They asked for testimony from some people that were around Jerusalem, yet everything they say seems to contradict what was said by the person before them. No one can actually pinpoint anything Jesus did wrong. So the chief priest, Caiaphas, goes straight to Jesus and says, Are you the Messiah? And we know where this ultimately goes. Jesus says, yes, and is condemned by these men to death. But my thought is this. There had to have been someone who disagreed with what the leaders were saying about Jesus. There had to have been someone who heard what was presented, heard the contradicting evidence from witnesses, knew about Jesus' good life, his moral teaching, and life-changing miracles, and said, Maybe he really is the Messiah. I would imagine there had to have been at least one or two people who disagreed with Caiaphas. And yet, no one says anything opposed to the high priest. These men decided without anyone dissenting to execute Jesus. Why? Again, I imagine Jesus posed a threat to the power and authority of these men. Jesus didn't conform to their strict and very specific code of conduct. He said and did things in a way that made them look like they were not as close to God as perhaps they should have been. And after arresting him, they decided they could get rid of him. Adam Hamilton says of Jesus that he was the emperor who wore street clothing to get to know the people. But when he told the leaders who he was, they killed him. In essence, I think they were afraid. And their fear drove them to kill Jesus. 
We see this all the way in the beginning of Mark's Gospel. Jesus spoke with authority and they didn't know what to do with it. And their fear bred insecurity and their insecurity turned to hate. And when we hate people, we do all kinds of inhumane things. Look at McCarthyism or apartheid. There's the Cold War and 9-11. Each situation that makes us scared leads us to do things we ultimately regret. But this isn't just about global political actions. Inside each one of us, there are things and people that scare us. And how we respond determines whether we will do inhumane acts towards others that we later regret, or choose God's way, which humanizes those who scare us and seeks the very best for others. Martin Niemöller is known for having written a famous poem after World War II that says, first they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak out because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. It's hard to see when we are scared or in a difficult situation, but we are dependent on others. We need our brothers and sisters here in church with us this morning. We need the people out in our community. We need the people that think like us and the people that think nothing like us. Niemöller's poem reminds us of this. Usually when we are scared, we ask, what can I do to feel more secure? But when we look at Jesus, how he responded throughout this illegal trial and brutal execution, we see love in his response. Jesus, in the midst of being punished by men who hated him, doesn't seek security, but instead asks, what is the most loving thing to do in response? So when Jesus is asked, are you the Messiah? Instead of doing nothing, remaining silent so that he can go free because he has done nothing wrong, instead he says, I am. He makes the bold proclamation that strikes fear into their hearts, and though the religious leaders should have been ready, should have been carefully watching and waiting for this exact moment, they let Fear went out. Edward Burke, a member of the British Parliament during the American Revolu Revolution, is known for saying, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Now, don't, under don't misunderstand what I mean by this. I'm not asking you to point out another person's sin. That is not courageous it's just obnoxious. What I mean is that when injustice is about to be done by a group you are a part of and do nothing, you have let evil win. Don't let it happen. Stand up. Do what is right. You know, fear is a poison in our lives and the cure for that fear is to stand up in the pivotal moment when two things are pounding in your head. One is, say something. And the other is, don't say anything because there will be consequences. When your head is in conflict and your heart knows what is right, cure that poison and stand up for what is right. That's what Jesus does when he proclaims I am. Lisa was in my office last week and she said something that has stuck with me. She said, it's the scariest things that are often the most meaningful. 
we were talking about a new role she may take on in the church. In the, in the next year, she's likely to step back from some of the roles she's carried for quite some time now and do something brand new. Many of you know it's hard to step away from the familiar and strike out into new territory. This is Lisa's dilemma. It's a scary thing for her. But she knows by the mere fact that it scares her that there is incredible potential for her in this new area as an advocate for public theology. As we continue to talk, Lisa mentioned family promise, which helps those who are homeless or in difficult transitions. Our church supports family promise by volunteering to make meals and stay overnight at the church. She said we have a very small group of people that volunteer to help with the overnights, and they were struggling to find a few more folks. Then she said to, to me these magic words. She said it, it even scares me to volunteer to stay overnight. And I told her, Lisa, promise me you'll volunteer at least once to do an overnight. Don't let fear stop you from doing something good. Let God move in the midst of your fear so you can go from seeking your own security to seeking the most loving response for others. I was proud to hear from Lisa the next day that she and her husband were signed up to volunteer with Family Promise. I trust God will move in their lives as they seek to show others God's love. And today, I want the same for you. I'm convinced that when fear strikes, God calls us to actions of love and concern, not hate or self-preservation. And when we show that love and concern for others, God is able to move in our own lives in powerful ways. That's what we see from Christ as he was condemned by the righteous. That God's love is more powerful than our fear. Amen? Amen. Amen. At this time I invite those who are assisting in Holy Communion to come forward.